Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Standardization of open source hardware. Um, as I described, or as I wrote it in my description, I won't, gonna, uh, I won't tell you about how great open source hardware is, but, um, because I assume you all know that. But for those new in the field, um, open source hardware is not about giving away machines for free, but it's about the question who owns technology. And as hardware or rather technology is how we produce our daily production goods or living goods and also the base of circular economy, um, I assume that's a super important question, at least for us. So we start with the term. And the term has been defined by some guys in the US, by the Open Source Hardware Association, um, that came out with the definition that open source hardware is hardware whose design is made publicly av available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on that design. So basically, you upload the design files, um, blueprints, and all of these calculations and stuff like that. And then anyone can build machines with that. And yeah. So this is followed by a lot of license terms. So what Oshba did is defining what open in open source hardware means. While hardware is rather clear, it remains open what the source actually is. So um, it is not enough to just share um, a quick sketch of your machine. Nobody can work with that. So what should actually be shared under an open license so others are enabled to modify, redistribute, and whatever your hardware? So it's also a question about the purpose of the source. What are people meant to do with it? And this purpose has been already defined by Oshwa, Open Source Initiative, and they boil down to these four core points. So people should be able to study, modify, make, and distribute the hardware. Well, we put that in an official standard, which is then the frame for the technical documentation of the hardware, because that's what you share in the end. That's also the first official standard for open source anywhere. So in that standard, we also acknowledge that this technical documentation depends on the life cycle phases that you are trying to cover. So not only introducing the hardware to the world, but also to maintain and operate it, and to recycle, refurbish, and whatever. So you need more documentation. And we also include um, the point that the technical documentation depends on the technology embedded in the piece of hardware and also that is used to produce the piece of hardware. You will need a different doc technical documentation for a 3D printed cup of tea without the tea or when you want to share a machine that produces cheese and slices and packages it. So, yeah, that's all nice, but um, why do we actually need a standard for that? Can't people just produce and, and document open source hardware? So, um, first of all, the standard defines what you should share, and apparently that's a huge issue. There's very few projects out there where, which are very good documented, at least for mechanical open source hardware. So um, you also, despite from enabling people to make use of your invention, you make um, technical documentation compatible and comparable to each other. So um, when we have two awesome machines documented well, and you can actually make use of both technical documentations, you can combine both to a better machine if you like. And second point, you can actually find it. There's no use if you just publish a lot of open source modules around the web. If no one can actually find them, then you need to reinvent the reel every time again. So the standard defines a common set of metadata so others can actually find your hardware. And as it's an official standard, we can put a trusty and community-based certificate on that. And this is meant to build a bridge between community, industry, and research institutes. As yeah, apparently industry and, and science need paper and certificates. And by that process, it doesn't really matter who comes up with the invention first and who uses it in the end. So all 
can effectively work together. The certification process has also been defined by the standard. Here's how it works. So you start with the documentation release, then you make an application, and then people can peer review your technical documentation, just as in science. And when the peer reviews state that this is complete and readable for others in the field, then you will have the certificate, which may look like that. And as the certificate is based on peer reviews, it's updatable and challengeable. So it's not a certificate just for your lifetime. Whenever someone else comes up with a negative peer review and they exceed the positive ones, then it expires. And this process is moderated by a certification body who can just be anyone who is capable to, um, to organize a repository which keeps all these documents open and transparent. Yeah. So that's how it works in practice, or that's the context of the documents. The technical documentation is in the middle. Both standards define um, how it is made and how it is certified. And there's a third document that I didn't mention yet. There's a guideline that helps you to make this technical documentation in the end. It also helps you in other points like legal issues around open source hardware, patent law issues, and a lot of stuff like that. And on the other side, technical documentation is uploaded somewhere. So people usually upload it on GitHub, Thingiverse, Wikifab, whatever they're um, alone in the English-speaking area, we have over 80 different platforms, and we de developed a search engine uh, that crawls these platforms plus Google plus YouTube, and then you can actually find what's, what's out there. And the aim is to make it filterable by the certificate. So when you search something, you can filter the results for what is actual real open source hardware and what is more DIY stuff. The nice thing about this map, it's all open source, um, even the standard, which was um, a lot of lobby work. But you can yeah, participate in the, in the standard and give feedback and then doing pull requests and other stuff. And then the National Standardization Institute in Germany needs to look at it and make you that in for, for the next version of the standard. Yeah. That was maybe a bit fast, but I wanted to keep it um, as, as rough as possible, as it's a complex field. And usually, um, it's, it's better to have a larger Q&A part about that. Feel free to ask me any questions about that. Yeah, especially the uncomfortable ones. I like those. Yeah, and then we can dig into the details. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is regarding the repository. Is it kind of a product lifecycle management system? Or is it like basically Git where you upload a bunch of, like you have a folder and you upload your CAD files, your calculations, everything? Or is it something where you can dynamically um, like pull out the data and say, like, hey, I have an assembly, I have a bunch of standard parts which are coming from like a shared library, and like you can all mix it up together? Um, this repository. This repository is not meant to store the actual technical do documentation, but just all the documents involved in the certification process. How people organize their technical documentation if they refer to other standardized parts is yet their issue. But um, as I say, that would make a lot more sense if we keep this hardware modular. So if there's a repository of standardized modules and people can look at it and, and yeah. So, hmm? so there's currently no platform that is capable of like resembling an open source product lifecycle management. I mean, I well, there is one in progress. Wikifactory is trying to do that, um, but it's yet a research project, so it's not yet usable. Okay, thank you. Hello, many thanks for your talk. 
Uh, first of all, it's very interesting that you really got it, uh, that Dean makes something really open source, even the specification. So congrats for this, <laughs> especially. Um, the other question, um, I think, um, the other uh, thing I would like to ask is, uh, in the open source software, you have tons of different license types. And um, is this only one license? Type so, so for example, in uh, you have uh, GPL or you have uh, BSD or whatever you you think of in, in open source software. Uh, what's the license type when you are talking about uh, open source hardware here? So um, for open source hardware, there's not so there are not so many licenses out there yet. There are three major ones, which is uh, CERN, OHL, the yeah most common one and the best maintained the TAPR license and the solder pad, and they basically split up into with copyleft mechanism or without, and that's it yet. So it's a free field. Um, but Oshba is um, pretty open to that, so they only define the license terms. Anyone can come up with a new license according, um, which is conformative to that. Yeah. Hello, uh, I have a question about this slide here, uh, the certification body, who is this? This can be anyone, so it could be you, if you're capable to hold such a repository. I mean, it's um, it, the standard defines how the certification body needs to be organized, and what he needs to do, but in the end, um, yeah, anyone can do that. You just need to state when you give out the certificate who you are, so who issued that certificate, and then, yeah, people, people yeah. can trust yeah. you there's or not. Hello, and there's also a, a specification for that? Uh, yeah, we have two documents here. So, um, yeah, I didn't mention that particularly. The standard splits up into the definition for the technical documentation and into the definition for the certification procedure. So, um, here it's described how this procedure works and the certification body has clear roles and tasks to ensure that is working. But again, um, any, anyone can just declare he's working in, um, yeah, in compliance of that standard. And um, that's actually how certification works in industry too. You can be an institute, someone is reviewing you and says, okay, you're com compliant to that standard. Um, the difference here is that we don't have a power concentration here. So whenever the certification body becomes corrupt, so, for example, my organization, um, Open Source College of Germany, wants to found such a certification body. Um, yet there's no money involved, so it's unlikely that we have become corrupt in, in some sense. But when money becomes a thing, there is a risk for that. So, but as all the documentation and the whole process is open, people can just fork us. So, um, when they find out that we, that we accept peer reviews from your friends, for example, that you call a few colleagues and then you say this is open source and yeah, whatever. So, so we have some, some corruption happening there and then you can just clone the whole thing yeah, and open your own certification body. Hey, um, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the specifications on how to uh, share your product data, your uh, technical documentation. So, for example, um, how is one supposed to share 3D, 3D data? Are there specific file formats? Or, um, yeah, so essentially, I think that the open source world is pretty lacking in that regard, for example, and I wonder if there's some direction given there. There is. Um, <laughs> especially regarding CAD files, we are not yet ready to only use FreeCAD or OpenSCAD, for example. So these programs are not ready for industrial use. So what we say in the standard is you need to share the original file format. 
but you also need to make the information available in a way that people can look into this information without any licenses. So you have your CAD file, and maybe people can look, not look into the CAD file, but you should share a drawing as a PDF or whatever, so then people can look into the ge geometry and tolerances on the other. So the actual information is publicly available, but um, the CAD model may be only available if you have a solder or whatever, a SolidWorks license or stuff like that. So um, we give recommendations, but we cannot enforce it yet, because for most um, companies that's just unrealistic. Yeah, if there's no more questions yet. There is. Yeah, there is. Sorry. What, what happens if uh, somebody uses the, um, the, 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 the certificate, uh, even though it is not applicable anymore because it's uh, challenged or something? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I got this asked a lot. What's the actual use of the certificate? So we can talk a lot about how valuable this can be for industry, but there's no one applying that. Who is applying that um, is science. In science, um, for a research project, it's um, a problem that you will construct any kind of prototype to test something. And as it's financed in advance, you, you don't need a business model behind that. You can just build your prototype, but it's usually not documented. So it stays in the laboratory and nobody will ever know about that. And plus, uh, people usually cannot reproduce your um, test results or all the data that you uh, that you produce with this prototype or testing environment because nobody knew knows how, how you build the machine. But if there's a standard and if there's a certificate, it's um, clear what could be documented and could be part of your research project. So people can put this into their application for a research project. It becomes part of it. They get money for the documentation and time for that. And so we have all this high-tech research stuff openly documented, and we also win a revenue stream, like money flow for this whole open source hardware field. That was the, that, that's the first application case. We are also working together with a bunch of um, media-sized enterprises which are interested in that. Um, they're looking more for a label or something, but um, they can also apply for public money. And whenever you apply for public money, your results should be publicly available. So certificate again. It all works with paper. And it's a huge um, authority, as it's Dean. These three letters make a lot. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm Drew from I'm one of the board members of oh, nice the Open Source Association. For you. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I was told about you from the Libre Solar uh, mm -hmm. a few days ago. Over um, here, yeah. Yes, and uh, Matthias is also here. He's also one of the board members. So I think this is really exciting what you're doing. Um, and I'd like to talk more about how um, I wasn't familiar with DIN before this, but there's other standards organizations like ANSI and ISO in the US. And I'm thinking maybe this would be applicable to those things as well, potentially. Um, th have you looked at other countries, how, how this process could work there? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. There haven't been so open yet for that. Um, the Austrian National Standardization Institute was kind of interested, but they didn't support us so well. And Dean has much more authority in the international sector. So um, this Dean spec is directly transformable into international standard, but it's under CC by SA. So whoever wants to publish this standard, could be ANSI, could be whoever, ISO, CN, um, they need to publish it under CC by SA. Yeah. So um, something like ISO is similar to DIN then, in terms of a standards body? Is um, on the ISO, is that kind of similar to what DIN, DIN does? Or? Yes, it's, okay. <laughs> it's um, actually the same building. So oh, okay. in, <laughs> inside the Dean building, you have 
yeah, in the first office is the national standardization, and if you walk down the corridor, there's the international sector, so just pass on the paper. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Well, what I could do, meanwhile, is showing you um, the Open Hardware Observatory, which I mentioned. So, Should I ask my question now? or? Sure, you can. If not, I... Ask um, a question. Already yeah. in uh, industry, documentation is quite a problem because people are generally too lazy to do it. Um, do you think that in open source hardware it will find acceptance <laughs> in a lot of cases? Or Depends what you want to do. Um, in the hardware sector, support is a huge problem. So um, a few weeks ago, I read, um, who was that actually? I didn't see who was talking. Ah, there, okay, because I want to look at you. <laughs> um, a few weeks ago, I read an article about um, Garden Roboter, and that was a relatively small company that wanted to um, provide 10 years support for their products, but ha coming out with a new version of their product every year. So that becomes a huge cost for this company, and they couldn't, um, they could simply not provide such a load of work for the support. But what they did in the end was open sourcing the firmware and some parts of the design so the community t can take care of that. So people have the effective um, ability to, to maintain their product and also to modify it and yeah, ask for help without costing this anything the company. So some are starting with that. Another ex example is uh, Soda Motors. I don't know if you heard of them. That they are developing an electric car in, yeah, in Munich. And they want this car to be fully maintainable by anyone. So they want to also develop um, yeah, an instruction how to maintain this car. They could do them that themselves and invest a lot of money in, in the actual writing of the manual, but they could also just um, write the first part and let the rest for the community. So the people that repair the car write the manual themselves. By that, they get a unique thing out there in the market. There's no car that you can maintain by yourself in all the details, yeah, at least in the electric sector. And um, they also get free feedback. So they see, see that piece that always breaks when I do this and that, or it's hard to repair. So all of these um, development cycles that cost a lot of money are free then. You're outsourcing things. So I assume that there will be free, few companies that will open source just everything, but a few parts of it, I guess yes. And five years ago, that wasn't some kind of impossible thing to pitch to, to companies to open source your, your development. Um, but right now, I don't know what changed, but um, everyone I'm talking to is like, oh, let's make a pilot about that. How can I collaborate with you? So there is a mind shift, and I didn't question that yet so deeply, as I didn't want these people to change their mind. Same for Dean, because what we're doing is undermining Dean's uh, business model, their core business model. And I, I don't know if all of them understood that. But well, they're super motivated in that. There's a, they're actually looking for an open source software project with standardization uh, motivations that they could support. So if, if there's any out there, come to me and I can link you. But I'm talking too much. Any, any more questions? What if not? Um, we could. Ah, oh, yeah. What's that? Um, I could show you OHO then. That's this. So um, that's the web page. You could just type in any kind of technology, any buzzword out there, anything you want to do, like wind turbine, and then, yeah, then it shows you what's out there. Yeah, and then you click on it, and, and then you come to the, to the actual design files. So there's no need to invent anything from scratch. There's, for almost all technologies, there's always some dude out there who did it 
and made at least a video about that. Yeah. Is my time up yet? Okay. So, yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>